so yeah, I will be talking about uh, about uh, how biology and materials are related, and. Uh, We'll see here. So my, my, I'll start here with an example, uh, which is to get a bit of feeling for what's the difference between a biological material or why biological materials are interesting. So we can take, a, you're all familiar with a material like, for example, marble, uh, and, and uh, that material is, is calcium carbonate, actually. There's a biological version of, of calcium carbonate, and that's found in, in seashells. So this is an abalone shell. And most of the, the material in these two structures, the, 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 the marble and the, cal and the, the seashell, are the same. So, so this is 95% uh, calcium carbonate. But the mechanical properties of this kind of material is completely different. It's orders of magnitudes better in mechanical properties than the, the statue there that you see already lost their arms or her arms because it wasn't strong enough. So basically with just small changes uh, you can get quite different um, properties. I won't demonstrate more the strength of this because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a memory from a trip. So. But, but, but uh, you can trust me on that. Okay, so why, why is that? Why are, are, are this kind of, uh, why do we find these different types of, of properties in materials. And what this seashell is actually, it's a composite material. And a composite material is a way of combining properties. Uh, these are very familiar objects here, a porcelain cup. It's, you know, it's very stiff. It, it, it won't bend easily and it's strong. But it's not very tough. So if you drop it in the floor, it will scatter. And, and for many mechanical and engineering uh, uh, sort of applications, that's not what you like to, to happen at all. Uh, you can have other materials that are very tough. If you have a rubber band and you drop it in the floor, nothing will happen to it. So it's very tough. You can do almost anything to it. But it's not very stiff, so you couldn't really build anything useful out of that. And there is a way uh, to combine these properties, and that's in, 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 in composite materials. And, and, and this is actually a, a composite material. So what's then in this composite, and what does it, why, why does it become a, a, such, a, such a, a good material? So if we then cut up these materials to a bit, uh, and, and, and look at them more closely with a microscope, uh, you can see a clear difference. So if you look at the marble here, uh, you can see that it's, it's not a homogeneous material, but it has a, a sort of it has small grains and grain boundaries and so on. And these are, 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 are crystals then of the calcium carbonate. The, the, the structure of the seashell is strikingly different. It actually looks like somebody had been putting small tiles on top of each other. So it has really a beautiful uh, structure there. And, and uh, the, the thing that we believe is happening in this type of material is that these bricks, they are very important to this structure. But in between the bricks, you have some sort of glue that keeps these together. And if you can imagine that you'd have a glue then that glues these bricks, of which are then the calcium carbonate, it glues them together uh, in a way that it both sticks very well to these surfaces. And then also it has some sort of rubber band properties, so you can stretch them, and they, they sort of yield a bit when you stretch them. This is, this is a theory how these kind of composites work. It's not the whole truth, because there are a lot of other things that come into, into play here also, things like interfacial energy and so on, and crack propagation and other terms, that we won't go into those now. So now a bit of uh, engineering uh, techniques. So if you, to, to describe materials in general, or, or one useful way or simple way uh, to describe materials is to measure their mechanical properties. So typically what you do is that you can take a piece of, of material and then you start pulling at it. And then when you pull at it with a force, you need a force to pull at it, uh, it will, if it's soft, you can imagine it easily, it will yield, okay? And, and then you get some sort of stiffness for the material. And if it's, if it's soft, it will yield a lot. So in this term, the, the strain is how much, the so the distance that it actually yields. And then this is the force that you use to, to, to pull it apart. So first, you will have a linear region here. And then after some state, you start to break the material and it starts to yield more and more and more. You can think of a chewing gum. And then at some point, it breaks. 
they, the pieces uh, fall off then. And then you get uh, a value for the maximal force that it can uh, stand. You get the stiffness. And then you get also a value for how much you can strain it. So this is quite simple. Uh, and we use this, these uh, values then to characterize materials. This is, uh, uh, this is then an example of, of, of a few different materials. Um, to, to, here at the bottom, we have steel, which is then familiar material for, for engineering. And the interesting thing is, for a material, for, from a materials point of view, that actually steel, it's, it's sort of a bulk material, uh, it doesn't have very much structure in it. But um, there, there are other materials. This is then a comparison of, of three different types of materials. This is cellulose and then something called carbon nanotubes and, and graphene. And the carbon nanotubes and the graphene are described as actually the strongest materials uh, that, we can, that we know. Uh, so, so these values are then the things that you got from the, 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 the tests in the previous slide. So the modulus is how stiff it is, how much it will bend in the beginning, and the strength is when it all breaks apart. So. Um, these are, are, are very good materials, and this is then uh, an, an image from a cover from a magazine, uh, uh, which then illustrates one possible use, that if you have this good materials, you could even make a, a wire, um, a cable, that would, by which you could uh, bring, take out satellites into space, because the, the strength of this material uh, on a weight basis is, is in principle enough for this. But there is one thing that this artist that drew this, this uh, image really didn't think of, that these materials are very small. These carbon nanotubes are only a nanometer in size. So it's really quite impossible to do anything like that. It's strong, but they are very, very tiny. So you can't really use them unless you pack them together in some way. And the same goes for, for graphene, which is a flat sheet of, of carbon. And, but interestingly, cellulose. Cellulose is on this scale also, well, it's not as good as these record holders, but it's a very good material. And if you compare to steel, um, well, it's in the same range. Uh, the strength is, is even greater. But then if you take the density, uh, the density of cellulose is much less. So actually, wood is a much better material than steel. But we don't really think about it in that way. Because obviously, we know that if we take wood or something, it's not as good as steel in terms of mechanical properties. And that's really uh, the difference here, that it's not, it's not the, the wood that is good. It's actually only the small fibrils of cellulose that are good. So here you can see how it looks in a plant cell wall. These are fibers of cellulose, or small fibrils that are produced by the, 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 the plant. And then uh, it makes these molecules. And, and in one of those fibrils, these are then long molecules. Uh, there's actually 36 of these that go, and they pack together very nicely. And if you look at these structures, even without fancy modeling, you'll see, uh, you can imagine why they actually are good. They are connected to each other, these, these atoms, in a, in a sort of in a, in a linear way. And then they pack together to form a very crystalline material. So you can have a look at that in the meantime. Well, but why isn't then a plant a very good material? Or it's good for some things, but it's not extremely strong. And it's because it doesn't need to be strong. These very strong fibers, they're to, uh, kept together by something called hemicellulose. And hemicellulose yields very easily because the plant needs to grow. So it needs to, to, to expand the plant cell walls. So it's no use for it to be very strong. So actually, a very similar thing is going on in these, in these um, in, 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 in the seashell structure. This is one Japanese group that found that they were looking at pearl, because pearl is also, that's the same material as this seashell that I was showing here. And pearl is very good, you know, if you, if, to know if it's a real pearl, you can bite uh, in the pearl, and if it's your teeth, that tooth that breaks, then it was a real pearl. And if, if the pearl breaks, it wasn't. So it's very strong. And, 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 and uh, they found that the glue material in between, this is not a complete truth, so there is one suggestion, that these glue materials is not the same as in, in this wood, this kind of, of, um, of, of uh, hemicellulose uh, sugar molecules, uh, but they're actually proteins. And proteins are quite different types of, of molecules. You find this interesting 
We can't go into details here, but these are binding proteins that bind to different components. So we can imagine actually that they are these kind of glue molecules. It's, it's, uh, the time here to explain how these glue molecules uh, work uh, is not really enough. Uh, and really not for a very long time did we understand how proteins work at all. This is a picture from 1958 when John Kendrew had first figured out the structure of a protein. And you can see that it doesn't look very beautiful. It was called a sausage model. I didn't tell him really anything. Just a few years before the structure of DNA was solved and everybody could understand how DNA works, at least nobody could understand how this protein works. And that was in 58. Um, and he looks quite bewildered. And, and that was so. And then they made even better structures. This is a low resolution and that's a high resolution. And still nobody really understood what was going on. Well, now today we actually know quite a lot. And, 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 and we can even understand which pieces function and how they come together and, and uh, we can make these uh, things and we can make them and change them the way we want. We can even change them in a way that we go to the internet and buy uh, genes for, for, for proteins and plug them into bacteria and make new ones. So we've come a very far, uh, far way uh, since, since uh, Kendrew there in 58. Okay, and that's what we've been studying, of course, uh, uh, in, in, in my group at, at uh, VTT previously uh, on how proteins stick to things. And, and, and this is one example of a protein that comes from a fungus that the fungus uses to stick to surfaces. And, you, and here you can see, uh, like Adam was telling in the last uh, talk there, that you can use this kind of microscopy where you actually can see individual protein molecules. So we really can understand them from a lot of different ways. These are barnacles there, and these barnacles, as if you own a boat, you know that when a barnacle sticks to the bottom of your boat, it's very hard to get it off. You really have to use a lot of force. And there's actually proteins that function as the glue there, and people know quite well how these glues function. So there are a lot of interesting uh, materials coming out of chemistry, and you can really see that these well, I was going to say still that this, this glue within this, this, uh, this bricks in a, in, a, in, a, in a composite structure, uh, we now know a bit how they work as proteins um, and, 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 uh, and, and, and try to figure out how to use them actually to build materials using other components that, uh, that for example, showed previously, the graphene and so on. Okay, so th that was just a, a, a briefing to how we think about materials from biology in different length scales. Um, there's something else happening at the same time. And this is a bit messy slide here. You can just look at the pictures if you want. The idea was, with putting this much information into the slide, is that this is now the, this is the, 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 the production in 2012 uh, of chemicals being produced by uh, biotechnical means. So there's something happening in the chemical industry that a lot of production is actually changing not to use the, 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 the oil uh, raw material and cracking and refineries. Uh, well, that's of course mostly used today. But there's a new thing happening, and that's actually used to, to use microbes like, uh, like yeast to produce these things. And what you do is that you change the, 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 the system in how the genes are functioning in the, in the microbes, so they will overproduce these small chemicals. But some of these are not very significant, these amounts. Others are already quite significant, like uh, polymers by, by lactic acids that are produced. Um, these are mostly small molecules. We don't really know the, the impact of this amount of protein is still not great for the world economy, but this is something that's happening, and if oil prices and so on um, keep going the way they are, uh, this will like, in fact be very, very economically viable. So the, the, the point here is that at the moment there is a lot of industry um, uh, being built up for, for, uh, for using microbes to produce chemicals. But what we learned now from the previous few slides is that if you want to make materials, there's a lot more of sort of functionality that we can dig out from biology. And if we can use uh, proteins uh, together with components to build materials like this, uh, it, it, it opens up totally new, new possibilities. And once industry gets used to using microbes to produce a lot of different chemicals, the step to change that to different types of products is really not that very big. Okay, so the conclusions here from, from, from this and sort of the conclusions also for the research uh, that we're conducting 
is first of all to look at biology for interesting examples of materials. And then I hope I showed you just briefly that there are a lot of these uh, in biology. And actually I mentioned just a fraction of this. Uh, we can have many other examples. Um, and also by understanding the molecular details of how these biological materials function, we can also apply them in different types of material science. So just also a, a, a basic understanding can give a lot. The biological science in general are developing very rapidly. Techniques are becoming available and industry also changing uh, and taking biological production methods into use. And so our vision is that by a combination of really understanding more of the complexity in materials um, and combining that with production techniques, there's actually a possibility that uh, materials industry and the materials we use tomorrow uh, will be quite different and involving then a significant part of, of biology. Okay, thank you.